kindly confirm whether you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Karafa. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it's nice to see us all. Um, I probably should pick Karafa to be doing all my introductions everywhere. It will help my life. Um, but thank you for that introduction. And it's nice to see all of us. I wanted to just go into the intro so that then we um, are able to leverage on the one and a half hours or so that we have to have this conversation. May I request that we all put up the, our full names in our, our gadgets? It will help us to be able to know who is here. So kindly put up both your names so that we have sight over who is within the session. Um, I can see somebody called N. Uh, kindly rename your gadget. I think I also saw somebody called um, WM. Please put both your names. I have also seen someone called Joe jo or J-O. I'm not sure. So kindly put up both your names. It will help us to know who is within the session. So I'll give us a minute or so um, to allow everybody to rename their gadgets. I mean, Karafa will also help me with that. Um, kindly note, we need to know who is within the session before we start. We are not able to proceed without guys renaming their gadgets. So kindly uh, prioritize that so that you allow us to be able to start. And are you here? Okay, I think I've lost N. Um, J-O, kindly rename your gadget. W-M, also rename your gadget so that we have sight over the people who are here. Um, Karafa, can you help me with that? So um, I want to be able to start um, the session. And I don't know if Karafa has uh, whispered a word of prayer. Allow me to pray for the session. Our Father, now we honor you and we bless you for this session. Thank you because you, Lord, um, orchestrated this session even before we started. And so, Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit into this session. We bring it under your Lordship. We pray that, Lord, everything that we will discuss here, the Lord, it will bring you glory, Lord. I pray, Father, that you renew our minds. I pray that, Jehovah God, you... you your word says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds. And so, Lord, I pray that through this call, through this conversation, that, Lord, you will renew our minds. I bring myself under your lordship. I bring everything that we will discuss here under your lordship. I declare that this is holy grounds and that Jehovah God is sanctify everything that will be done here by the blood of Jesus. I thank you for Charles. I thank you for Celestine and for the conversations that they will facilitate with us. And for us, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit it orders their conversations, Father. Lord, we ask that you would be here, Lord. We ask that you hover in this place. We ask that, Lord, everything we will speak here, Lord, that, Father, you will breathe your presence in it, Lord. For you tell us of a time when there were dry bones, Lord. But, Father, you ask Ezekiel to prophesy to those dry bones. And as he prophesies out of them, an army is raised. And so in the name of Jesus, I prophesy into this place, Lord. Father, we are all dry bones. Would your breath fall on us? And as your breath falls on us, Lord, would you raise us to be an army that you use to do your, your will in this season, Lord. We bless you, we honor you, we invite you heavily into this session. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so um, I wanted to start today's session with um, just a quick run of what we are doing. Today's session hasn't gone through um. Oh, LinkedIn, we just thought we wanted to have more a more intimate conversation. And so we started last, I think it was last week or the week before last, it was the week before last, a conversation around the Renaissance. And the goal was to ask what can we learn about um, the current times that we are in from the Renaissance. And we did, and I have 10 minutes and Karafa will help me to manage my time because if I don't do that, then we will um, eat into the other's time. 
Um, but the Renaissance was a period of um, Europe, significant European cultural, artistic, political, and economic rebirth. In effect, if you want to summarize the Renaissance period, it was between, I think, 14th and 17th century. It prevailed, to, it started in Italy, and it's called the, it's termed as the bridge between the Middle Ages and the modern day civilization. And in many ways, the Middle Ages were also called the Dark Ages. There was a lot of war, a lot of ignorance. I am of those political people when people use words like ignorance, but there was a lot of war, there was famine, there was pandemics. And so that's why it was called a dark age. Um, and then through the Renaissance, we transitioned to today's uh, modern civilization. Some of the things that were a big part of that, you've seen these photos. These photos were a big part of the Renaissance period. And so art was a dr driver of the Renaissance era. Um, and there were that's where you hear about the Michelangelo, the Leonardo's, just coming up with images that represented the present and the past and what they anticipated the future would look like. And so they used art to be able to represent religion, to represent society. And so a lot of um, questions were happening because this was the first time that art was being used to communicate what people saw. Um, and then around that season, the, the printing press was discovered or the innovation of the printing press came through. It's almost like when you have the mobile um, and the mobile became a reality, meaning some of us um, during our early 20s, there was no phones, perhaps they started to become a reality in uh, mid-20s or uh, Basically, we didn't go grow up with mobile phones. So we see mobile phones as a big deal. And so that's what the printing press was. Um, it was a driver of the Renaissance. All of a sudden, they, they couldn't just print uh, through art. They couldn't just draw. They drew, but also printed. And because of that, ideas could spread easily. And so in many ways, it's similar to the times that we live in today. And so we are comparing the Renaissance era with the transition we are going through today, which is a digital transition, um, and sort of thinking of what's modern day art, what's modern day pretty press, and what are the lessons that we can learn from the Renaissance era that are applicable in today's world. And so we spent some time talking about Renaissance and how it changed religion, um, I am a huge uh, believer, um, and so I incline heavily towards religion. But I also think that religion impacts lives for believers and non-believers, and so I like to see the various transitions. And so the Renaissance era is when you had Martin Luther becoming a big deal, um, and he started to question the Catholic Church, and that led to the Protestant Reformation. And because of that, you had quite a bit of war around that split in the religion. There was a high focus on human um, when you think about education, and today you hear people talking about humanity, um, a big part of that was born during the Renaissance. Um, and the conversation was, well, in the past, pre, in the Dark Ages, um, everybody talked about everything being dependent on the will of God. Um, during the Renaissance, the conversation started to hate and beyond the will of God and to start to talk about um, an act of own capabilities. And so they started to spend time on that whole idea of it's not just about the will of God. God has empowered the humans. And so that became about humanism and asking what's the capacity and the power that humans have. Um, and that was a big part of the Renaissance. People learned to read, to write, to interpret ideas. Um, and people had their own voices had. And so it was a transition in such ways, um, also close examination. So if people are reading, they're writing, they're forming their own ideas. They started to ask, but is this religion really real? And that's where then Luther questioned many of the practices in the church and whether they were aligned with the teachings of the Bible. And so a lot of today's religion was shaped in that Renaissance. And we spent some time in the last session, I won't go into this, talking about sort of some of the innovation lessons we can learn from the Renaissance. One of them was around the talent, talent needs patronage. And we talked about how one of the families would take up the talented Michelangelo, bring them under their feet or under their family, depending on how you want to look at it. And they would be serve as patrons to that talent. And because talent had patronage, then it became the art that we know about today. So Michelangelo and the others were built by this family. So we talked about talent needs uh, patronage, mentors matter. We spent some time on that and how a lot of that art was built by mentorship. Um, we talked about potential Trump's experience and there was and a story around how the church took Leonardo, Leonardo's 
um, art and showcased it in a big church that was being built. Well, she did, he didn't have any experience, but they saw the potential. And so they leveraged on the potential and the idea was potential Trump's experience. But of course, there's an element of patronage. The right people say, you have potential, you will be had. Um, and then disaster creates opportunities. A lot of this came through after the Black Death, um, the pandemic that happened, and people started to question a lot of things. Um, there was a gap as far as labor and access to labor and so people there were fewer people people were negotiating or fighting for their rights because they were fewer and so many opportunities came about because of that disaster and you will hear even today just some of these things coming through in the current age that we live through i mean and another lesson that has been said from that renaissance period was embracing competition that each of these artists were competing heavily among themselves and that allowed them to constantly innovate um and just just making room for healthy competition. It seems that humanity move forward in the context of some healthy um, competition. And so embracing competition was part of the lessons we talked about. And then all this was in search for meaning and purpose. And so as people did a search for meaning and purpose, they then encountered this innovation. And we spent some time talking about um, the value of all those things. So I don't want to spend too much time on the things that we talked about. I want to just to highlight one or two thoughts to build up on that. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about the great things about the, the Renaissance era. The Renaissance era was not just great. It had a lot of issues. And so the slide is about great cultural and intellectual growth yet. And we're using the word yet to represent there were also very many issues in that Renaissance transition. And I've just highlighted about six of them that I just wanted to flag up um, so that we think about them as we talk about the digital transition. The first issue that was highlighted during the Renaissance, the Renaissance around elitism and then exclusivity. Um, and during the Renaissance, the flourishing of arts and knowledge was often limited to the wealthy, the wealthy and powerful elite. And so as we talk about the digital transition, we must ask, are we making the same mistake of elitism and exclusivity? Or how can we learn from them to make sure access to education, patronage, opportunities for artistic expression are not restricted to elite few, but that they are opened up. And so that was one of the bigger issues during the Renaissance. And you see it also in the digital transition. Another issue was around economic disparities. And you will, I will use India as a case study. And you will hear that during the Renaissance, economic growth was concentrated in certain regions, certain classes, certain families, which led to even more disparities and marginalization of certain groups. And you will see the same thing in today's digital transition. And the the reason I'm highlighting this is it's important for us to learn the lessons that that era presents for us and hopefully be able to ask what can we do differently. Um, there were issues of gender inequality. The Renaissance era marked was marked by deep-rooted um, gender inequality with women often excluded from education and professional opportunities. Female artists are hardly talked about. You see them as the Lady Mona Lisa photo, you will see them being, paint, being painted, but you will hardly see them being as the front artists and thinkers. And that cannot be that women cannot be artists and they want thinkers. I mean, they face significant barriers of recognition and success. And in what way do we make sure that the digital transition doesn't have similar issues is something to think about. Some additional things that were challenges as part of the Renaissance was around cultural appropriation and colonization, because it was it wasn't built on just systems, because it wasn't built on equality. It became about extraction. And so people would go and extract people's culture and draw it up. And so there was backward extraction so that people looked at the Greek, the Roman civilization, put it into art, but also extraction of existing societies. And so when you think about colonization and some of the practices that came from colonization, they are rooted on the principles that were started during the Renaissance era. And that's to say the dangers of an era in terms of the kind of principles that it builds up on a society. And so in their quest for knowledge and inspiration, Renaissance explore, explorers sometimes engage in cultural appropriation and colonization, exploiting the knowledge and cultural treasures of other civilizations without proper acknowledgement. And so how do we make sure that the current 
a transition, the current Renaissance, if I dare say so, doesn't have the same issues as the Renaissance era. There were ethical considerations in science and exploration. You will hear same issues in today's session. Renaissance sometimes lacked ethical considerations, uh, leading to unintended negative consequences in local population, in the environment, excessive use, focus on individualism at the expense of community um, welfare. And that was anchored on the conversation of humanism. And so one of the bigger things that came through from humanism, which was important, is the power of humanity. But also the power of humanity propelled individualism. And so there was excessive focus on individualism at the expense of community welfare. In what way is digital transition doing the same thing? I was reading a book and we're talking about it in the Crossroads class. I can't remember the guy, I think it's called, he starts with E, I've forgotten his name, but the book is called Suicide. And it was around just the high levels of suicide during this middle age. And he went into a lot of research to ask why. Why is it that during this transition from agrarian to industrial, this transition from a middle age to modern age, there is high levels of a suicide. And at the heart of that he found was the excessive focus on individualism. And so as we talk about the metaverse and the possibilities that technology presents to us, in what way is it also building on individualism and we would end up writing other books about suicide? Do we want to do that? So those are some thoughts that I wanted to just share with us and um, use them to talk about briefly um, India. I spent a week in India, which is such little time, uh, but I just wanted to share some thoughts that I could observe from there. Um, one of those speakers, Celestine, went to India and hopefully she can throw in one or two additional thoughts um, from her time in India. It's such a country of extremes, but I just wanted to share some one or two, uh, four thoughts that um, stayed with me. One of them is just based on the Renaissance. The thing that you see is India has embraced innovation. They've embraced the transition. Um, and they are owning it fully. And, uh, and one of the questions that you hear in many spaces, so we were there just before the G20, there were some pre, pre G20 conversations going on. G20 are the 20 greatest, 20 countries that contribute to the greatest GDP. It's a ridiculous thing, but it is what it is. I think there's only one, not I think there's only one African country, South Africa, which is in the G20. Um, but then you have all your other groups other nations. And so they were meeting to discuss what are the big things that are going on economically, what does it mean for us? And at the heart of the conversation and the reason they chose to go to India is because India has embraced innovation. And the conversation that you hear in India is around in the industrial age, people construct roads, people constructed rails. Uh, but in today's world, we need to build digital public goods. And so people, the G20 is being held there so that they can have conversations around what can we do with the digital renaissance or the digital revolution that's going to reduce poverty and hopefully decrease inequality. On paper, what is shared is that India has lifted, and I think this is real, let me not talk about it on paper, India has lifted 404, 415 million people out of poverty through use of digital tools. Um, and what digital has enabled them to do is to make social protections accessible. So if the government has health care, uh, and you're entitled to healthcare. Digital transition, they use digital tools to make sure that you access that healthcare. And so that has lifted 415 million people out of poverty. Now it's a country with 1.3 billion people. So 450 million people is a big deal, but also you still have issues uh, within that conversation. And then they talk about their digital catalysts. Um, the big digital catalysts are Adar. I don't know if I have spelled it well. I am Kiswahili person. Nijasama Vila Nigeria, Athar and UPR. And those, um, Athar is a digital identity. So they're the one country that has the largest pool of digital identity. So they've done what we were attempting to do with Huduma without. Anyway, let me just explain what they've done. They have given every single person an identity. So you have one identity card, but it's a digital card which says that Esther's, all Esther's details are saved in that digital card. How old, 
where my, her family is from, uh, her health status, her education status, where she lives. So when the government opens up that number, they can tell everything about Esther. And that has plus and minus. Plus is if Esther needs support from the government, it's easy to see. If Esther is unemployed and needs some government um, subsidies for employment, they can see that. If Esther has issue healthcare issues and needs um, some government support, again, they can see that. So that's the power of the digital identity and it's what has made the social protections access accessible to everybody. On the other hand, digital identities are dangerous in the hands of humans because if you wanna control humans with digital identities, it's very easy. And so there are some conversations around that. Um, that are happening. And then they have what they call UPI. It's a payment system that has catalyzed financial inclusion. The easiest way to explain their UPI is M-Pesa, but a government controlled M-Pesa and therefore it's not using mobile, it's using back to, it's, you can use mobile, but it's bank to bank transactions. So you don't have mobile to bank transactions. Um, there's issues around it, but the plus for it is it has given a majority of people access to banking services. And if people have access to banking services, you have financial inclusion. With financial inclusion, you have social protections. And so those are their two big kind of digital catalysts. Um, with a third 80 million daily authentications empowering citizens and catalyzing access to citizens, eight to seven to eight billion monthly transactions, therefore revolutionizing digital payments for financial uh, financial inclusion. You have account aggregators, which therefore then democratize lending and borrowing through data-driven solutions. And then you have a lot of open protocols. And I've talked about the open protocols. They think about um the digital solutions as public goods. I want to just bring to a few examples and then perhaps start to conclude this conversation. There's an app they they talk about a lot that I like. It's called I Got Garbage. Um, it speaks towards equity and inclusion. And the ish, the idea behind I Got Garbage is a marketplace for garbage. Um, and I think that's important in today's world. There's a lot of conversations happening around carbon credits, around waste management. And so the idea behind I Got Garbage is people on the ground, what took our ground to benefit from those carbon credits. And so they've created a marketplace where if you have garbage, you put it up in that app. And then there are people who, uh, it's almost like an Uber of garbage. So there are drivers who come and collect garbage. And then there are people who release the garbage and both make money out of it. And so it's, I got a garbage, it's, transform, it's transforming a marginalized waste management. While in the past, it was just a few people like in Kenya and Adora specifically, the specific people who make money from waste management. And the money for waste management has increased. Through I got garbage, they are democratizing the access to the resources for um, waste management. Management. There's another one for called Commons Farm, which supports small um, holder farms addressing supply chain challenges, echoing equitable growth. The big thing with this, and I think in Kenya we have a lot of such apps, but what they have done that's a bit different. Our apps are fragmented, and so people start farming Kenya. Another one starts, I don't know, selling bananas, trigger. And then another one. But in this case, because it's a digital public good, they are then aggregated by the government. And there are plus and minuses to that. The plus with 1.3 billion people, if you then have a common place where small scale farmers are being supported, then you're able to do bigger good. Um, and so you ask, for example, if we have tomatoes that are getting lost in Kalenjin land. As an example, um, how does the government create an app where then people in uh, Kitui are able to buy those. And so you're almost digitizing the marketplace um, through commons.farm. We some thoughts we need to move away from constantly reinventing the wheel and refocus investments in enterprise architecture. This is a big philosophy that they are sitting with, and that's the reason they call them digital public goods. Um, the idea that we have in Kenya of digital goods and digital innovations being personalized is means that everybody is reinventing the wheel. And so what they have made a decision to is to ensure that a lot of these things have a digital public's good. And so they have there's um, access to everybody. And I think that's an idea that we would want to sit with. Um, this they're struggling with, but it's an important idea as we think about digital community ownership and participation is key. Um, the idea that people in Kawangware don't understand tech is a misnomer. 
but it's a misnomer that I had a lot in India. And because of that, engineers and tech people build solutions with the idea that people on the ground would understand tech. But if people on the ground don't understand tech, then you increase the digital divide, i.e. you increase people are not having access to those solutions that are meant for good. And so that whole idea of whatever solutions are built uh, should be anchored on community ownership and participation is key. I personally think that's especially important with data. How do we make sure that as you collect people's data so for example for the id you read your eye eyeballs um and that's what they used to identify everybody that's significant data how do you make sure that that data is owned not by governments by communities i mean we had a debate around this because we are the idea is that we don't have such models but the fact that we don't have such models shouldn't stop people from imagining new models because the idea is equity and inclusion if we don't do that then you end up with powerful governments and powerful tech companies and those don't serve people um there's an opportunity for india to embark on digital but diplomacy this is something they're talking about widely um to take it's made in India digital public goods to hundreds of emerging economies at the top of their list is Kenya. Let me explain that a bit. China has made headways in Africa through roads and, and rails infrastructure. The argument is India can make rail, can make headways into Africa through digital diplomacy. And so when they build digital public goods, the thinking is how will we export these digital public goods to Kenya, to Africa, so that then they have influence in the space of digital. A lot of conversations you could debate with with that. Um, and so building on existing infrastructure for good was a principle that I saw that I just thought is important. Um, they have more than half of their population is still below uh, the poverty line. I saw poverty, I was told it's where I was daily. I was told there are states that are better me, I only know where I went. That kind of poverty is bad. Um, I saw poverty that reminded me of Kenya in the 1990s. Uh, but in reality, India has such high levels of inequality. And it's possible for technology to continue perpetuating inequalities. Um, we had debates with engineers and tech around issues of equity. And one of the things that I concluded, and I'm, I'd love for us to have that conversation if we have time, I am convinced that technology should be a second degree. The people should have a first degree in sociology, in philosophy, in uh, psychology, those degrees that enable people to understand humans. So that then after that, you can be an engineer, a tech person who builds for human beings. I so many instances of techies, engineers getting excited with the process of building, but you cannot build good things if they're not anchored on humanity. I mean, so one of the principles we concluded with was um, always assume the worst. I think it's written somewhere here, um, somewhere. As grounding the data conversation on what's the worst that can happen. And if you're an engineer or a technical person to build things with the mind of what's the worst that can happen, if people use this technical solution for bad, what would happen? And um, that conversation is important, especially for builders. And then we talked about data and justice and grounding the data conversation. What's the worst that can happen? Um, building a sense, a strong sense of responsibility in our tech people, in our engineers, because they will determine the world that we live in. And it's easy for us to replicate the same issues we saw in the Renaissance era. And then ultimately public participation. I saw some examples that were basic that I liked. Um, APO has partnered with the government where they pay people uh, when they exercise or eat healthy food. So you know that watch that you use if you exercise um, 20 kilometers, I don't know, I'm just using an example, but assuming you run 20 kilometers, uh, APO has a partnership where your 20 kilometers are rewarded with some points or some cash. And the idea is to get people to own that, that whatever watch, but also to take part in technology. Um, there were examples of citizen governance where I think this was in Singapore. Um, if carbon credits in a space go to beyond a certain area, Wi-Fi is switched off. And so the community has to ask, how do we manage the carbon credits in this area? Um, there was one last example of during COVID, there was a number that was being used to determine who gets the vaccine. Um, and then there was an issue of certain number ages. People, people of certain ages were not getting COVID vaccine, but somebody went into it and figured out a quick code and they shared it with the government, they tested it, and then it was corrected into the app. Uh, but the point there being public participation so that technology is not a foreign 
thing. I am done. I know I have run through my conversation, but my job was to introduce. Um, I hope I have triggered some thoughts um, that you can see to it. It's a lot, it's little, but let me just recap. And then I will invite the next person to share their thoughts. I've talked about several things. I've recapped the Renaissance um, and sort of just how we're using it to learn for this season. I talked about some of the key lessons from the Renaissance era, but also introduce some challenges from the Renaissance era that we should think about so that we don't replicate the same issues. I used the case study of India. I talked about how India is thinking about technology, how they're using it to get people out of um, poverty, um, their big digital uh, solutions, um, and anchoring those solutions on humanity. I talked about some of the conflicts they are having around data and justice, around public participation, and other things that I mentioned. My goal was to trigger a thought. Um, I'd love to hear what comes for you um, later on. I will probably open to hear from one person and then I will hand over to Karafa to invite the next person. This is a bit of a packed conversation. It's why it's a masterclass. Um, if it leaves us with questions, we have done our job. Uh, and we will have, I think we will have some session for Celestine and Karafas, the details, and then um, with Charles Simba. And then after that, we'll have an open session. But perhaps I'd love to hear from one person just to make sure I didn't go too fast, which I do know I did. But it would help me to hear from one person. What is a thought that's coming through for you? Um. Celestine, did you want to say something? Or... Yes, I wanted to say something. I was looking for the raising my hand. <laughs> I'm no, sorry. Yeah, so I'll put my camera on because um, I've got, uh, I'm looking at uh, data uh, connectivity. I think for me, it's more of a comment um, than a question. Uh, it's very, very insightful for, for to begin with. And when you, uh, my, co my comment is about India, obviously, because I studied there. And uh, I, 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 you, when you say Delhi, um, the, in India, it, uh, uh, we always used to say uh, India is just the epitome of shocking Asia, where there is extremities in everything. But mm. uh, when you're from outside, you would never understand until you understand the caste system, because mm. with the caste system, there is some certain type of people who would never go beyond what they have, because mm. that's how religion says, like, if you're the feet, you're the servant for life, um, which is very mean. But uh, it is what it is. And it's very hard to break those kind of systems that have been there for thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of years. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of those, um, uh, 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 like the lower castes, they embraced Christianity and mm -hmm. now made Christianity even lower than being a low caste, which is quite weird. So when mm -hmm. you're in India, it, it's very shocking for a first time visitor. But when you live there, you get to understand why it is how it is. Mm -hmm. And even if you give the same opportunities to these different sets of people, there's just as much as they could go. Mm -hmm. um, so that is just basically what um, my comment is all about. But India is very, very developed when you get to live there and see what they've done. Just as I heard say. that. I just kept thinking to myself, I want to see this. I mean, I could see the extremities and you could see how the roads divide New Delhi and Old Delhi. Um, but I, I like what you the, the perception you're bringing around the caste and the power of history in determining what people build and how they build innovations. Um, thank you, Celestine, for that thought. Karafa, I want to hear your thoughts because you're the one I know, and then you can pick up one more person. I want to make sure that we don't leave anyone behind. And then after that, you can introduce. I think Celestine is going to go next. Right. Thank you, Esther. Uh, that was a very insightful conversation. One thing that really stood out for me was if engineers were to build solutions asking if this was to take it to the extreme, uh, what are the sectors that we should put in place for? Uh, but then I was also trying to think around, is that really the work of the creator or the work of the user to first have uh, a moral background to be able to use this tool? Because mm -hmm. then I would argue having such questions during innovation stages will hamper the innovation, the innovative process. But there's mm -hmm. still a lot to think about, especially that we're diving into an age where AI is quickly becoming 
uh, you know, it passed the tourist test uh, a while back and now we are hoping it will only grow better. But then the question is, if it grows, what happens to us? And I liked your thought of maybe first we should have, you know, the, the social sciences as the first degree so that you have a, a humanistic and moral background before you equip with these powerful tools. Because even from what you just discussed, you know, if I have access to 800 million user data information, what can I do with that? Should I decide to go to the dark side? That is something we should all be wary about. And, and thank you so much for sharing that. And I really look forward to uh, to sharing more of this. I'm glad that I work close, uh, close to you so then you would share more of these discussions. But for the sake of those uh, who do not share the same privileges I do, I would like to invite maybe a member of the team who I have seen here. And uh, now, Paul, I'm going to put you on the spot because I called you earlier and uh, you are very enthusiastic in in sharing uh, your greetings. And I know you're also someone uh, who operates within this space. What has stood out for you in this conversation so far? Hi, Karafa. Hi, everyone. Hi, Paul. Hi. All right. Um, so for me, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for putting me on the spotlight. I wasn't expecting it, but here we are. This is what we do as Lapidas. Um, I would say for me, it's the fact that the users have to also have knowledge about the tools. In however they look like, they have to know how to use them. So I think for us, the most common thing is USSD. Mm. Uh, can run USSDs on whatever type of phone they have. But then they are, we have problems beyond USSD as a solution. So then how do we teach this person? How do we teach, uh, like Esther put it, the person in Kawangware? How do we help them uh, make, first of all, use the tool, and secondly, use it in a way that, um, one, they are not going to the dark side. <laughs> and two, um, like of also like take their own self-awareness into that conversation mm. of how the tool should be used, the benefits they should get, and even um, the intentionality of using the tool. I think for me, that's what has stood out. So. I'm I'm looking forward to hearing more. I've seen there's a hot lineup of speakers. So I'm here for, for it. I have more questions, maybe at the end of the session. All right. Thank you, Paul. Esther. No, I'm done actually. I love the thoughts that both you and Karafa, Peter, I mean Paul and Karafa, you have. I am glad that you have even more tech guys to speak to them because I think they're important questions. I hear conversations around innovation versus responsibility and ethics around it. I hear conversations around education and um sort of how do we make sure people understand the, the users informed. All those are fantastic questions. So I will throw the ball back to you so that you introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Esther, for that fantastic keynote uh, session. And we hope that that has set the tempo. If you at this moment, you need a glass of water because what's coming up is even hotter than that. I will allow you a minute or so just to do that as I welcome our next speaker. Please ensure that you take notes. A good number of these conversations are also flying past my head and I consider myself a very technological savvy person. But anyway, every day we learn and we hope that in this session, we'll be able to look even further as to how we can embrace these lessons to create a positive social impact. And to welcome the next speaker who will be taking us through how do we use technology to ignite purpose-driven technology leadership. Now that's a lot of things, but let me introduce it, the speaker who's coming up and then you'll understand why we are able to have these conversations. Our next speaker is coming up is none other than Celestino Pere, who is the founder of Celestino Pere Consulting and Glaxo Tech e-learning, which is an e-tech-based startup. She has consulted in various capacities for renowned enterprises such as Google, Facebook, Norwegian Refugee Council, to name but among others. She has also sat as board member in the IHUB Nairobi and is also an expert on the education and skills of the World Economic Forum. 
with a career spanning across various industries from telecommunications to retail to technology, Celestine has accrued over 15 years of experience in personal growth, motivation, research, corporate and business development. She has worked in extensive environments all across Africa and is very passionate about marketing and promoting personal development while improving lifestyles by embracing and incorporating technology and through entrepreneurship. Now you can see why she is the best person to talk to us about how do we ignite purpose-driven technological leadership. With a drive and open-mindedness regarding learning and new digital concepts that can be applicable and beneficial to enable educational and entrepreneurship content in relation to e-commerce and marketing commerce through technological platforms and applications for the youth who are the future of the continent, this is a session which we will seek to understand how do we bring together our potential for leadership and marry that with technology to enhance and leverage our impact. Celestine, without further ado, I welcome you to the session. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming her to the mic with those digital claps, those digital claps, as I hand over the session up to Celestine. Celestine Karibusa. Thank you very much. Um for inviting me and uh, I hope I will keep time. <laughs> there is so much to talk about and the time is so little. And uh, the introduction, I think um, you did me well. And coming right after Esther, I'm feeling a little bit challenged because she was really like uh, well-researched and it was quite um, eye-opening and, and, and very, um, a, a lot of data and details um, that I hope that I'll follow through. Uh, with a little presentation that I put, I put a simplistic presentation because I know um, it, the, the whole masterclass is going to have a lot of insights and a lot of data. And and, and educationist who believes in the power of storytelling. So what I'll do is that I will just um, probably share my screen. I don't know whether I'm 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 putting a whiteboard. Is that uh, the screen sharing? Oh no no no. Not quite. I could support you in sharing your screen. Share Okay, okay, let me see. Yeah, you could, I, I could share it. I can share it. I hope it is, um, it can be seen. Yes, okay. it is. Okay. So Maybe you could I, have it in present. Yeah, yeah, I want to do that. So I'll, um, I think you've done me justice in introducing me very well. Um, is, 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 it, is the screen sharing well? Uh, actually, we can see the other view where we can see uh, your notes. Uh, you can see my notes, not my screen, not my slides. Yeah. I'm trying to see. Maybe I went straight into slide sharing. Can you see my slide now, no? Still no? No. Okay. Maybe I stop sharing it. Can you see yes. it now? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. Um, so um, I'll be speaking on, uh, on the topic of tech for good. Uh, I'm also a startup grind Kajiado director and uh, probably i'll introduce a little bit of what uh, startup grind does what startup grind does is just bring in a group of entrepreneurs and startups who use technology to leverage um uh tools and digital tools from different uh, uh organizations and companies to be able to project their businesses um in a positive manner or in the communities that they have so what we do is that we encourage uh, SMEs or startups that uh, have have are doing um, probably community projects to embrace technology to see what like the scale or the the reach that it can reach in terms of uh, um, reaching more people for impact in whatever uh, projects that they are doing it could be agri tech ed tech um, uh, biotech or or, or um, e commerce. Well, mostly because that's where uh, 
most of the startups are located, especially on the African continent, and also logistics, um, where housing probably, I'd, I'd put it in terms of e-commerce. Um, so my thought process in, um, in, in, in creating this presentation was in line with looking at how most of the startups that uh, we've interacted with and also the ones that we've worked with or, or heard about have been leveraging technology uh, to be to push themselves to the next level and also the impact that they have in communities and what are the leaders deliberately doing in terms of uh, digital tools to pivot themselves to the next um, uh, phase or the next place. Um, so I'm strictly looking at how um, we can ignite, um, uh, uh, we can use technology to ignite leadership, especially in organizations in startups in in SMEs that we are thinking of 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 of, of having we are working in or even partnering in if you're looking for a partner and you're a leader in an organization what do you look at in the next um uh, partnership what collaboration are you looking at in terms of 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 tools or digital tools uh, just as Esther said it is quite imperative for us to look at somebody's core business or core passion or core uh, direction uh, in, the, in, in terms of what are you currently doing, if it's a social side, looking at the empathy side, and then looking at how we can kind of like collaboratively put technology in or, uh, or connect it with the technology that would enable it to either scale or, or, or reach wider audiences or communities in an ethical and, and uh, rightful manner without um, it having a lot of uh, conflict with whatever either culture or, or, or um, even personal preferences of the community. And also looking at how you can nurture your, your career in a tech-driven manner, not necessarily just like how uh, we're looking at, um, uh, is it the WorldCoin uh, guys who came in, they were just taking people's irises and they did not even explain the importance of why they were doing or educate the people because they understood that people need money and this is where they can get data very easily and fast for whatever experiment that they are doing which was quite wrong and when you look back at how all this resulted from um, conversations and, and, and history and what people are talking about is that either this same company has been around for the last three years and it's been having that kind of mass drive of taking people's irises. It's just that it was not open, but this was very strategically put where they brought in a lot of people in one place at once. But you're left to wonder where was the government when they were even booking KICC to begin with for this kind of mass drive? Did they question what was the intention of that? It's only when people blew up the whistle and say, why is our data being taken? And that's very serious data to be taken to be paid for for very little money. But can you imagine how many people paid uh, uh, or had already given their data? We have no idea. So being deliberately conscious of what technology you're using and how it's going to affect the masses is very vital. And um, when we even think back, um, the same company that created ChatGTP, which is OpenAI, are the same people who have this wild coin. So it, it, it's something that they've done here before got called out and they came back again with a different uh, uh, leverage. Maybe this was the last phase of what they were actually doing. We will never know. Um, so when you're looking also at um, technology in terms of uh, social impact, I look at, at, at three or four aspects where technology can be used for uh, social good, which is very critical and very important um, when you're looking at how we can kind of like throw ourselves in or embrace technology for a better good. There's a company called uh, Medic, Medic Mobile, that uses technology to improve healthcare access to underserved regions. This is very vital because most people in the uh, underserved areas use the mobile phone, and even it, it's it's a um, like the Kadunda phone. So it's very imperative when you're dealing with people from those communities, you're putting an USSD kind of like messaging in those kind of phones so that those people will be able to leverage, just like what M-Pesa did. 
this is um, what M-Pesa did is a revolutionary that people have never really understood and it's never worked anywhere else. But uh, I guess it's because also of how Kenya is and how we operate when it comes to financial that enabled it to work, that we always need short money quickly, uh, uh, fast. But in other areas like in South Africa, M-Pesa was seriously rejected. And why was that? That was because banks, they, they have like three or four major banks that control the economy. So bringing in an Mpesa would kind of like disrupt the whole system that has been set and that is how they have been surviving on manipulating and getting a lot of profit from the masses. Mpesa would be a very critical game changer for them. So it was rejected from the start and it makes us think, sit and wonder especially when we are creating a, a product, are we even involving other stakeholders in the ecosystem when we are bringing these ideas to them? Sometimes it's nice to try something, uh, a pilot incognito without people realizing, and then you prove your, your, your solution with the numbers or with the impact that it has done, or let the work speak for itself, especially when it's a community project, rather than always thinking that if you want to do use technology for good, fast, you have to fundraise. That is not critical or necessary. It is actually going into the community, working in line and in collaboration with the community, involving them and enabling them to move to the next level. The other thing I would, uh, uh, another project I would give is the Project Loon that was launched, I think, by the Uhuru government during COVID. As nice as it sounded, I don't think uh, people on the continent or people in these marginalized areas had been consulted in these kind of discussions and 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 uh, and uh, uh, the policymakers that were involved in making this project uh, be launched in Kenya, because after a few months, the whole the whole balloons, I think, there was some somewhere around Congo, and they all fell down and got disrupted. So you can imagine the amount of money that had been launched on that project that ended up failing without. Be, be, without considering uh, the communities that had been promised that they were going to access internet because of these balloons. So that project failed miserably and it was scrapped off by Google. So those are some of the projects that you look at and you're like, how was that project really for social good or it was just to um, kind of like pave path for a different kind of project that was coming. And now we can see Starlinks um, that has come but it's not necessarily like a, how Project Loon was. It doesn't provide internet access in rural areas for free, but it people are paying for that, for that good of service. Because what people realize is that when you don't involve the stakeholders that are going to leverage that technology, the project, there are some things they would have overlooked or seen ahead, especially during the pilot phase that they didn't see um, that uh, very restarting so and capitalized on it that they're going to make uh, uh, internet connectivity for people only who can afford it. And then um, with the case study in this kind of social good, what I look at very strongly and I look at it from a tech, an edtech background is the Khan, Ed Khan Academy. Khan Academy was actually uh, created by uh, the, 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 the founder who is the Mr. Khan to teach his nephew or his niece um, science um, very easily uh, from cross distances. And that enabled his niece to be very good in, in science that he decided why ca how can he make it free for everyone else? So it's a very good resource that everybody looks at or all teachers or educators look at understanding how um, it's got uh, uh, very well researched uh, information and very simply explained uh, examples for small children who are getting into STEM and it pushes them to the next level of, are we, uh, 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 are we going to leverage this platform to kind of like use it for our children or our students to be able to get, it, get information on concepts that they don't understand. So many students who find it difficult to understand concepts in class, once they leverage on Khan Academy, they kind of like tend to understand very clearly and better all these concepts that would otherwise have been difficult, especially when classes are big. Um, the next, uh, I'm trying, okay, uh, the next uh, 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 check for good that I'll talk about is just 
embracing uh, um, uh, ethical practices that we need to start uh, uh, looking at when we're using technology just to prevent bias. Um, I look probably at, um, at, at at AI, which is like a very hot kick at the moment. When you're looking at, uh, uh, let's say a Tesla, uh, from the explanation of what they have explained, how the AI can enable the autopilot of the car, what we have not seen is how um, probably uh, Tesla has also embrace kind of like in, in inclusivity in terms of of, uh, of race, because I was reading somewhere where uh, most tech, uh, uh, Tesla cars have not been able to uh, kind of like identify uh, if it is uh, it, 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 racial profiling of, 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 um, of, 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 of of pedestrians when they are walking, so that is something that was not factored, especially when they were when when they were when they were programming the the the, the, the program for the car to when it's driving. So those are some of the things that we need to kind of like when we are developing or partnering with a with a partner who's probably embraced AI. Are they? Cutting across all profile, all ethnics, all cultures, um, all communities that could be possible, especially regionally, depending on the market that they also want to access. And also, are we also developing AI that have that also considers people with disabilities? Because those are people who have been really uh, like excluded from main conversations that are happening. Everything that's going on when you when you're when you have a disability, it means that you cannot access the same opportunities that somebody who's able could access. Uh, Microsoft Microsoft has developed AI for people with disabilities, which has I, I think it's just one of the few companies that has also looked at and considered um, developing uh, 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 products that also include people with people with disabilities. And when you're looking at uh, a case study of this. It's how um, Tesla, it's, it, it's a only company, car company that has also looked at uh, balancing, you know, their innovative streak also with safety and uh, the autonomy of driving autonomous cars. They have taken up, like if, if you give a, a comment on, on, one, on, on something that you have observed it's not being, has not been done, they take it upon themselves to at least embrace it and leverage on it and include it in the next research and development phase, which is something that um, when you are a leader in a, in, a, in a startup or a tech company or a company that wants also to include technology uh, through partnerships or develop a technology, these are things that you have to critically look at. Don't look only at the type of audience that you think should be using the product. You can also look at audience that would need the program, but product, but they have not been factored in because when you look at the numbers of people also who have disabilities, they are quite many, and disabilities also come in the forms. And uh, when you're looking also at uh, the, the the next point, which is uh, nurturing purpose-driven tech careers, it is very important um, as you're becoming future leaders or in the tech space or embracing technology in leadership to look at companies that actually encourage their employees to align their work with meaningful goals. So whatever that you're doing from a technological angle, please look at it also from a social and community angle so that whatever you, 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 you kind of like walk your talk. Walking your talk is very crucial um, in looking at your career point going forward because apart from the profits that you're making or the, the, the earnings that you're bringing into the company, what are you uh, the the uh, that you work with in terms of the community impact of what you're doing? And if a company does not give you um, enough space for you to actually do that community work and give back to 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 society, you should really sit down and rethink whether it is even progressing you because doing community work or doing community things that are aligned with community or uh, uh, designing uh, products, projects with uh, uh, tech projects or, or tech products 
with community in mind enables you to think wider and also make sure that you, in your heart, you know that you are at peace with whatever, uh, 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 let's say if it is your, your, your social aspect, your social aspect is being put out positively rather than just thinking uh, it's all about gaining, 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 or making more money that you're going to either put in the community. Sometimes that's not what the community needs. Getting money from them through, back into the community doesn't really work. Rather, creating products that enable you to impact their communities in a positive manner so that they appreciate using your product or your uh, participating in your projects with the kind of philanthropy that you're having in mind. Companies like Salesforce always have a model of allocating 1% of equity, time, and product to philanthropy. This is very important. When you're um, getting into a company, make sure you are entering a company that allocates some time at least into philanthropy. And you have to be very specific about that uh, if for you to, to know that you're feeling fulfilled. Otherwise, you'd be jumping from uh, place to place. And, and also, there's a company uh, that's called Beneviti that uh, 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 encourages employees to connect, to volunteer their opportunities to, within communities. And if you can, if, if your company does not do that, try and work into, try and partner with or sign up for companies like this, where you can actually volunteer some of the services or some of the knowledge that you've got in communities for good. Um, so probably I'd give an example, a case study over here for that for Pat Patagonia. It's an ethical tech initiative that balances pro profitability with uh, environmental social responsibility. They also uh, leverage technology to track supply, supply chains um, uh, for sustainable practices. This is quite crucial, especially now um, where we are looking also at the green carbon footprint, uh, what are companies doing, especially in the supply chain angle. Um, so it is very crucial for you, even if your company does not participate in that, try and, 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 and register yourself on platforms where you could actually uh, do a volunteer to give part of your services or some of your skills and knowledge uh, to other communities. Um, and um, probably that is the last um, uh, slide that I wanted to present in terms of uh, uh, tech doing good for community. I was looking at uh, uh, not going overboard in time because I know there's another speaker uh, uh, after me and I wouldn't like to eat into his time. So my conclusion would be probably to recap of the key points that I've talked about. Um, and that is uh, leveraging technology for social very crucial, um, embracing tech, ethical tech practices. That is something that um, when you're doing AI or machine learning, which is now trending or becoming very current, please make sure that you, you question and you ask. Uh, probably had the people who are, who are, who are uh, uh, taking the database of the, 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 the people who volunteered their eyes, had they asked these tough questions before even volunteering, um, we would have, we would have, uh, we would have avoided the mishap that happened and the misinformation that happened after the whole process was an act. And also um, nurturing purpose-driven tech in careers, it is very, very important because it starts from there. So probably my call to action would be for each of you, as you're thinking of aspiring and growing, um, try and become uh, uh, purpose-driven tech, uh, tech leaders. And also I, I would really encourage you to explore different innovations that have worked in different places. Whenever I'm looking at examples of technology that I can embrace, and, and, and Esther, probably I'd, I'd give a comment there with what you said. I always look at uh, innovations that have worked in uh, India and in Bangladesh, because that's where you find um, uh, extremities in terms of the very rich and the very poor. So if you're looking at even uh, a technology that would really work, for the very, very wealthy, and that is the first world, you still look at India and look at what the upper castes do and, and cities like Bangalore that are the tech capitals of, of probably Asia. And then you're looking also at, 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 at products that can work in really seriously 
marginalized and 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 and, and slum like populations you look same still at india and you'd be very surprised of the information and and whatever that you get out of there it is quite interesting and eye opening and uh, uh, trust me when you start doing your research with that in mind you'll find that your ideas and your mindset and everything that you're doing really changes because you find some people who are really passionate about community and humanity and what they are doing the impact the name or the legacy that they would love to leave uh, apart from the technology angle um, to communities that they are associated with. Um, I think I'm done. If anyone's got any question, comment, I think this is the time. Uh, thank you. I hope I'm within the time frame. Thank you, Celestine. Thank you, thank you Celestine, for uh, that very insightful and also practical conversation. I liked uh, that you give us case studies that we could always go back to. I remember the first time I interacted with WorldCoin, I was just wondering why would anyone not take this? Uh, I first had not gone uh, to get the incentivization that they were giving people, but uh, over time I decided against it. Well, but I like that. Uh, we're asking the hard questions that need to be asked, even for us who are not even participating in the technological space. Uh, let us continue to share our questions and share our thoughts in the chat box and we'll be able to see that. I know we have another Q&A segment after we have listened in from our speaker, uh, our next speaker who is none other than Mr. Charles Simba. But before I get to that, I'd like to talk to you guys about how can we become purpose-driven leaders, especially for young emerging executives with over five years of experience. We have an answer for you, and that is the Lapid Crossroads program. The program has been designed to enable you to grow into a purpose-driven leader who is able to merge their purpose in life with the work that you do. It will enable you to build your self-awareness and enable you to equip you with the skills that you need to lead teams and drive change in your organization and create a culture of high performance, not only in yourself, but also in your teams. And I'd like for us to hear from one person who has gone through the Crossroads program and is also within uh, the tech space. Uh, and this is none other than Ivy Remo. And she's not here with us today, but she uh, managed to participate in one of our videos. And I will be sharing that as you hear how she has managed to leverage on the skills and the mindsets and the networks that she has gotten courtesy of the Crossroads program to leverage her career growth. A fantastic class did it in 2020, which also made it a very interesting time, right? Because COVID times, lockdown also at a crossroads. I was already thinking about what do I want to do next, about work, about my life, and boom, I found myself in the perfect class. One has ever told me that there's something called entrepreneurship that you can actually build in the company and spaces you are at. For me, that was phenomenal. So that changed my mindset in this way. If there was a problem or a gap I thought I could fix, right? then I would look at it, okay, how would I go about building a solution for it? That one is mindset, but mindset is a game changer. How do you change the way you think and look? And that's like part of my everyday life, you know? I need to look 10 years ahead, 10 years behind. When they talk about leadership dynamics, they ask you if you're gonna lead others, you know? You have to be in a growth mindset 24 seven to be able to do so. So that was just fantastic. A fantastic class did it in 2020, which also made it a very interesting. And so that, ladies and gentlemen, was Ivy Remo, who's currently a product lead engineer at Singlify. And if you're keen to expound and ignite your progress as a young executive, feel free to share with us your details by completing a brief application form that has been shared with you in the chat box, and we will reach out to you with the next steps. And speaking of next steps, I'm about to introduce to you another fantastic technological expert. He has extensive experience in the field of technology and he will be looking at some of the things he will be covering is how can we as young emerging leaders leverage on technology in this trying time. And so Charles is a technology strategist and advisor dedicated to assisting executives and organizations to address their most pressing issues. 
and he is passionate about assisting African businesses in digitizing their operations and fostering the next generation of innovative African technology companies. In terms of technology and innovation, he feels that this continent is a green field, full of opportunities for indigenous farms and individuals to establish their livelihoods and new progressive stories, all through use of technology. Speak about the Silicon Savannah. He has at least 18 years of progressive experience in businesses and digital transformation, worked with extensive, extensively with several well-known organizations in the banking, insurance, hospitality, logistics, supply chain, just to mention but a few sectors, both in Africa, Middle East, and in the UK, among other European countries. He is an academic and professional qualification. His academic and professional qualifications are in computer science and in professional project management. He has previously a master level solution leader at HP and technology consulting manager at PwC. And over and above that, he has served in the advisory board of Lapid Leaders Africa. And so he's a true uh, patriot of this particular community. And he has also served as the honorary secretary of the Nigerian Society, Go Maroon, none other than Charles Timber. Ladies and gentlemen, help me in welcoming Charles. By putting your hands together, those digital hands, those digital hands that we have learned today. Thank you, Lillian. We need at least 10 more before we hand over the session to him. I'm glad, I am glad, I am glad. And I hope we have not yet filled our heads. More is coming. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And uh, that's a wonderful, one, wonderful uh, introduction. I'm very happy to be uh, uh, having this conversation within the Lapid community. It's been some time since uh, since we've been around, but uh, I, I, you know, I was here a few years ago when um, Lapid was in its early stages, and that was a wonderful, wonderful time. And I think just to see what the team has done so far is uh, is, is actually amazing. You've come very far, Esther, and uh, congratulations to you and all the cohorts that. Uh, that have put in the effort and the dedication to get to this point. Before I get um, into the detail, I know uh, there's been a lot of really, really, really profound content uh, shared by Celestine and Esther. I hope uh, you can hear me clearly and you can see the, the, the screen that I'm sharing. Uh, again, Karafa, thank you for the introduction. But I would like to to base my conversation today, not necessarily, well, it's good that uh, it's, a, it's a tech conversation, but first I'd like to say that I'm a dad and uh, that a lot of my perspective uh, is informed by that role. Then when I'm not doing that, I, I work in tech as, as you mentioned, uh, Karafa. The reason I've mentioned being a dad is because today, uh, even if I'm in my forties, I actually wish that I was 11. So I'm the dad, I'm the father of an 11 year old, but I've got other other kids as well. But then observing uh, the, the, the kind of interests that an 11 year old has, and the fact that um, by, by the time this particular son of mine was nine, he was already taking interest in robotics and uh, building code and just trying all manner of different things. It gives me an element of formal. You know, I wish I was at that stage uh, in my life where uh, I, I I was picking this up as an interest, as a pastime, as something to, to have fun with. Because uh, for my generation, for people who are in their early to mid-40s, uh, we learned computers by going to college after high school. So we didn't learn, we didn't grow up with uh, phones, uh, you know, smartphones. We didn't grow up with computers at home. There was no internet in this part of the world, but then seeing that in an 11 year old is, 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 is fantastic. One other reason I wish I was 11 is because 
I think that this is a generation, and I'm, I'm going to substantiate uh, my, uh, my assertion. I think this is the generation, people who are 11, 12, 13, these are going to be the guys that actually do the big things in technology and in innovation in this part of the world. Uh, the reason for that is uh, they're growing up in a time when, from the time somebody can speak, this, uh, from the time that somebody can play their toy, they already have a smart a smartphone in their hands and they have internet and they have uh, all manner of digital tools to start with. But that's on a very personal level for, 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 for the child. In a broader sense, they're growing up in an Africa that has a huge digital st uh, skills gap. And this is an opportunity in the sense that you're growing uh, up in a generation that is uh, uh, growing up at a time when there's opportunities to be part of a 230 million uh, digital workforce, which also translates to potentially away from the 230, there's going to be an additional 400 million plus uh, training opportunities also related to, to, to digital skills, digital careers, uh, generally in digital life. And some estimates from the World Economic Forum put uh, the value of this trading opportunity and the skills development uh, for this at 130 billion US dollars at the present value. Uh, part of this is also, this is the generation that got uh, some shock treatment in the sense that Somewhere along their schooling, there was COVID, and uh, for my son, for example, I think he was eight or nine, and they had to stay at home for a year. And during that year, they had to do uh, school from home. And during that year, they then had to uh, step up their digital literacy. So very quickly, they had a shock treatment that pushes them into digital literacy. But then with a the promise that in seven years, when uh, my son is 18, you're walking into a marketplace that has all these hundreds and hundreds of millions of digital opportunity. In Kenya, for example, by 2030, uh, it is anticipated that roughly half of all the jobs are going to be uh, digital uh, jobs. A majority of these are going to be uh, traditional jobs that have a very large digital component. So it's going to be accounting going to be legal practice, it's going to be medicine, it's going to be design, it's going to be the arts. But then a big differentiator of this is going to be that uh, there will be uh, a big element that relies on digital. And we're already seeing a lot of this uh, already. In, in other parts in the West of Africa, uh, slightly less, but then large population. So it's 35 to 40 percent uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, Rwanda. And uh, if you go a little to the south, to Mozambique, roughly a quarter of all the jobs, uh, you know, that are going to be there in seven short years are going to be digital. So I want to be 11 because I want to get to 18 when I have all these options. I, I promised that I was going to substantiate uh, that it's a good thing to be 11. But there's a historical part of this that I'll only touch in a little bit. And you know, you're know, you welcome to, to have a look at this from what is called the digital uh, driver's template, which has been designed by Dalberg and the Digital Alliance uh, quite recently, that tells the story of Kenya in the digital space over the last 20 years. Um, the people in my generation like to, to talk about politics. We like to talk about the way the economy is difficult. We, we like to talk about where is this country heading? But while we are having that conversation, the people that are 11 now are having a picture for them that's being prepared in a very, very profound way. And some of the things that have happened over the last 20 years, roughly uh, from the time I was getting of age and getting uh, into college in 99, uh, a number of things happened. So one of the things that happened, for example, in the year 2000 was the launch of Safaricom as a department within Telcom. And Safcom, as we all know, has gone on to be one of the largest companies across the region, not just in Kenya. 
uh, in 2003, when uh, Mwai Kibaki became president, there was an introduction of pre-primary education. So right now, uh, more than 95% of people in this country um, have a primary education. And there's also the, the conversation about uh, about 100% uh, transition into high school. So things that we don't quite pay, pay attention to, but that have made a very, very big uh, uh, change. There was, for example, a national ICT policy that was done quietly in, in 2006. And then shortly after, in 2007, MPESA came. And on the back of that, uh, Equity Bank began a massive rollout of grantless banking, which meant that you no longer had to go to your own branch. You could now take uh, your funds to uh, to bank in, in any equity branch for as long as you already uh, were a member of the bank. So it looked like an ad. It looked like a bank uh, that's only serving their uh, their customers. It looked like you know just com competitive strategy. But then this single act by equity then created a, a, a very very big part of the platform that uh, that we now sit on. Come to 2007, there was uh, the post-election violence, as you know it. Uh, bad news, terrible time for a lot of people. People lost lots of property, um, life. You know, it wasn't an easy time for 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 a lot of people. And I I can guess that everybody within this um, uh, uh, conversation today knows somebody directly that was impacted by that time. But what that PEV did, the post-election violence of 207, 208 did, is, it, is that it normalized the use of cashless transactions. Because there was a time there were no banks, you couldn't get money, but then you had a neighbor that had a PESA. So that person gave you a thousand bob, and you did a transaction, and you paid them, or they did it on friendly terms, whatever. But then this single season, uh, to a very large extent, contributed to a very large uptake of M-Pesa and uh, you know digital payments as, as we know them. I'm going to speak uh, to skip a lot of these areas, but then in 2012, Facebook became mainstream in Kenya. Uh, 2015, Obama was here. Um, there was a lot of other things happening, like Ajira in uh, 2013, um, uh, which was creating digital jobs within. Uh, the, the 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 public sector and supporting private sector to 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 bring bring about digital skills etc. And there was also uh, uh, the Huduma centers and the Huduma number conversations that happened in the second term of of President Uhuru Kenyatta's period, uh, followed very closely with the Data Protection Act uh, in 2019. Um, CMA did a few things on the regulatory space. And again, within the education sector, there was a big, big uh, uh, change within the education in this country by way of CBC, which I know we make a lot of memes about that CBC is this, you're doing carpentry at home every night, you have to run to, <laughs> to, some, to the market every night and pick vegetables and do an experiment. But what CBC has done is mainstream digital literacy for 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 public education uh, for for a very large pro uh, proportion of the population. So, with this foundation, a number of things have happened. There has been a massive rollout of infrastructure, a massive change in policy, a massive uh, development of skills, uh, mainstream skills as well as. Uh, end user skills as well as engineering and STEM and, and, and computing heavy skills. And there is also some unprecedented things, some unexpected uh, difficult times, for example, COVID-19 and the post-election violence, which then created uh, watershed moments within the technology landscape, which then uh, set up Kenya as, 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 as a very, very big uh, 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 country in terms of uh, our our maturity in a digital sense, as well as as well as uh, a skills base, as well as uh, a place where the government is taking the lead to 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 get some things done 
and prepare the future for um, and for future generations that are working in this space. So it's a good time to be 11 for, for the reasons that I've given. But then what does this mean? Well, all these things were happening. What then uh, uh, this meant was that uh, there were obviously winners and losers. There are people who are the forefront of this. There are people who are in, in, in places geographically where there was not electricity, for example, that could not access digital literacy for example, during COVID. But what does that then do in terms of the opportunities that they have access to in a digital context vis-a-vis -vis the opportunities that other kids that grow up in an urban area um, have at their disposal? And we know that uh, technology uh, for our generation and for the generation that come thereafter is probably the single most important element to drive um, dignity, uh, to drive uh, livelihoods that are that are depend, you know, if you have a skill, for example, you know how to read and write, and you've got a digital device, and you've got access to the internet. There is very, very little uh, you cannot teach, uh, learn by yourself. There are very, very few cultures you can't experience by yourself. There are very, very few jobs that you will not be aware of. Compared to a time when there wasn't internet, there are no digital. Uh, tools and things like this. So you had to, for example, if you want to know how to make a, a Filipino uh, dish, you had to find somebody who already know, knew how to do it. In many instances, you had to go and experience that culture by going there directly. But today, if you wanted to make a Filipino dish, all you have to do is access to the internet and you're done. If you want to teach yourself a musical instrument, same thing. Previously, you had to go to a school that taught uh, music instruments or find found a, an in a person a teacher exactly. that that would enable you to do that but then today as long as you have an internet connection and as long as you have a digital device and as long as you can read and write you pretty much can teach yourself uh, any skill for that reason uh, this one thing is the single most important uh, driver of creating uh, dignified livelihoods and 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 you know taking away poverty from uh, communities that would ordinarily have had to suffer a lot more. Uh, that said, um, then what is the opportunity that somebody who's 11 has that somebody much older would not have? So there are two elements of this. If I was 11 today, um, there's an element of learning tech early that I would have that somebody else who's coming to, to, to the party in their 20s or in their 30s or in their 60s will not have. You grow up with the technology, so you have a very, very unique understanding of tech and what it can do for you on a very personal level and how you can apply it to your day-to-day -day life. For that reason, uh, also paired with the reason that uh, the, the, the people who are much younger now are more socially conscious. They know a lot more things about the communities and the society around them. And they speak up because they have places where they can speak up. So when I was growing up, if you want to, you, you wanted a story that you wanted published, you had to get your parents to help you write a letter, send it to a magazine editor or a newspaper editor or to a radio uh, producer or a TV show. And that person would decide whether or not they were going to read your letter and make it public. Uh, public. If you wanted to get the attention of the president today or, uh, you know, a certain public figure or somebody that you admire, all you have to do is find a way to reach out to them on social media. And in a short time, you're able to interact with that person or people that are close to that person. So for that reason, this is a generation that is socially uh, and environmentally conscious, and they have been brought up to speak out. And they then have uh, a very, very big role to play in the sense of um, uh, the fact that they already understand tech at a very personal and a deep level, even before they are literate in many instances. And more importantly, they have been grow, you know, they've been raised in a, in a context of advocacy. You speak out. You have an opinion, you share it. You don't like something, you speak out. You like something, you put a like on it. You like somebody, you follow them. 
You don't like them, you unfollow them. You don't like them some more, you block them. You know, that's <laughs> the environment that people who are 11 uh, grow up in. For that reason, and for the reasons that I've given, that, you know, there's a big, big, big investment that has gone into this for 20 years or more even. Uh, the real innovation and therefore the big money is not going to be uh, made by enterprises as we currently know them, but the real innovation is going to be uh, driven by people who are just getting started on this journey. And the reason for that is if you looked at this model that we have on the on the on the right hand side, the people aspect, you know, I talked about free primary education. I talked about colleges that open out uh, engineering schools. I talked about the ability to teach yourself skills. So for that reason you've got a base of people that are already serving. On top of that uh, there's legislation and policy that opens up the competitive space in, in, in the context that then allows infrastructural um, investments in a way that wasn't there 20 years ago. On top of that, there are things or platforms or services that join together all manner of sectors of society. For example, MPESA, telecom services, banking services, um, you know, reg tech and, and, and things around uh, um, authentication and identification of people through Uduma number, IPRS, and things like this. So the base three layers are, have already been uh, created. What remains is now the real business innovation, the real robotics, the real uh, smart applications, the real smart business applications, the real uh, personalized uh, data analytics so that you're able to understand your consumer at a very, very personal level and treat them a certain way, for example, if you're running an e-commerce business. So the foundation has been created and in a short while um, we will have a new generation of people that then can innovate and, uh, and, and build on top of the foundation that's there. And what can then uh, this look like in a context of technology for good? Again, because of the fact that this investment have created an element and it's huge, uh, digital divide. This generation of people that have grown up with, with, with digital tools and the technology and with the internet and with social media have a big, big responsibility when the, the time for them to, to, to act on this responsibility comes around helping to reduce the impacts of the digital divide by they themselves um, building their own skills through formal training and other kinds of learning, but more importantly, sharing these skills that they now have with another child who is now an adult or another person that grew up in another uh, part of the world or another part of the country for them to then be able to also participate within the digital economy. That's a big uh, responsibility that I would have if I was 11. Uh, number two, because of the skills that they have and the platforms, another way for them to participate is to then use the skills that they have to develop low-cost technology that is then used across all socioeconomic um, uh, you know, spaces. So not just high-tech that is expensive and exciting and only available in an urban area but, and accessible by people that speak particular languages and that see the world a certain way, but then there is a need to then use that advantage of being digitally savvy and having grown up as a digital native to then develop technology that is accessible by all generations across multiple social uh, economic uh, backgrounds. Number three is advocating for change. This is purely manda mano. Just speaking up and saying, um, we are a voice of change, we are young people. Uh, the future is mostly about us as young people because we are here, you know, uh, longer than older generations. I think this is a fact of life. And for that reason, we would like the people that have a say and the power to make change to be aware of these things that the, that the digital divide is doing and their investments and put uh, policy interventions to then help uh, the people that are negatively impacted by the digital divide 
to then participate in in uh, in uh, in the digital economy and therefore to take advantage of what's possible uh, in terms of dignity in terms of livelihood that is brought about by digital uh, lastly uh, my own belief is that if you're a professional working in um, technology or innovation or in the digital space, it is important that you make money and you live a comfortable life. It is important because that way you're able to have freedom. That way you're able to have a lot more impact. But then most importantly, that way you're able to, uh, to, 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 to give hope to people that are coming after you that investment in skills and in discipline and in showing up for, for work in this space actually pays off. For that reason, the fourth um, opportunity that, that, that people who are 11 now have in this space is to create mainstream commercial technology that makes money, that creates jobs, that creates uh, freedom and comfort for the people that are willing to make an investment in this sector. Karafa, I am going to pause here unless there are further questions. Uh, that really is, is the message I'd like to, to, to share today. Oh, thank you so much, Charles, for that. Uh, well, so I think my only question for you, and probably you can uh, summarize this in the panel discussion is, what happens to us who are not 11 years old? I was just trying to look through this and I'm wondering to what point can I get into this pyramid so that I can end up there? Because it's true, uh, we need to be able to leverage on these opportunities to make money. And because money in today's world is power, then you get to make the substantial change and sustainable change that we will want. Thank you very much, Charles. And just to now hand over the mic back to Esther to try and bring us. Um, to bring all this together in a way that we can take home some actionable steps. We have had quite a bit. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how OpenAI did WorldCoin, what could they be doing with ChatGPT all together, coupled with what you shared about India and what Charles has shared about the digital natives. What does that mean for us today? Uh, because I'm also very certain that other than uh, yeah. the son of Charles, none of us here is 11 years old. What do we do um, with this information that we have? Esther, Karim Sam. Okay, thank you, Karaf. I think we have about 10 minutes um, and then we'll run a bit late with this uh, session just so that we make sure we do the Q&A session well. Um, but maybe uh, Charles answers that question. Uh, are you saying for the rest of us, no? <laughs> My apologies, Charles, you can now unmute. I hope you didn't lock me off because of... Uh... Yes, we are just thinking, <laughs> you decided, remember we are advocates, so we will just mute you and go, Charles, go. Yeah, no, I think there is a place for every generation. Um, the context of the 11-year-old is, is, I think... By the time they're getting into into the market, uh, just young adulthood, is when all these factors are then in place. So the whole history of you know hardcore infrastructure, all the investment around uh, uh, financing, and uh, you know access to finance by by people that are in this sector, uh, all the conversations around skills, you know high end skills, maybe level skills, all, all manner of skills as a factor, all the conversations around enabling policy and legislation and regulatory environment. I think it's at that point that all these different ducks are finally in a row and these guys are finally of age. So these things exist today, but then there's a time element that then needs to go and then um, uh, to then unlock all the benefits that have been put over the last 20 years. And by that time, it's going to be uh, roughly 30 years of investment. And it's going to be now 
uh, seed time is done, it's harvest time. The real uh, takeoff then comes in at that point. And that then coincides with the, with the time that people who are 11 now, then are just getting to 18, they're getting into into ad, early adult to, to then take advantage of these opportunities. Okay. Um, I want to recap some of the things that I've heard from Celestine and from Charles, but I will be the I'll ask one question and I'll also invite the rest of us to ask a question. The one question that I have for both Charles and Celestine is I'm 25. I have refused to grow old. So let's imagine I'm 25. Um, what, <laughs> what are the, and, and you had Karafa talking about what a 25 year old is thinking about today. How do I make money? How do I become rich? So I would love to advise from you guys around that, um, especially around what are some of the ripe possibilities for me today and I think you probably have both mentioned them in passing but I want just a clear these are the two things I imagine that I would love for you I would advise you to invest yourself in I am going to ask you those hard questions so that I've just um asked by people who are not me but anyway yes two things um but let me just recap a few things as you think about those two things that you'd advise us I love what you said, uh, Celestine, and I love the way you you guided us towards thinking about innovations in India, thinking about innovations in Bangladesh. I think for me that struck a chord um, because those economies have a similarity with us. And so when I think about a similarity and yet a scale, so when they do the work for education or they do the work for health and they come up with innovations in those spaces, if we figure out how to learn from them and then use the learnings um, in this context, I see a lot of possibilities. Um, and so I, I really loved that. Um, and it therefore then takes me to the second question that I will just invite you to, uh, to do, uh, to speak to around what does that look like in practice? Again, I'm 25 years old and I really like the idea of I'm learning from India, learning from Bangladesh. I see that as a possibility. What's two things you would advise me to go do? And they could be simple as YouTube, or but whatever it is, just two things that we can go and do to be able to figure out um, the opportunities in other emerging economies that we can learn from. So that was the first thing that I picked from you that I loved. The second thing I picked from you is the value of understanding your values and then being able to leverage on your values to build a purpose-driven tech career. Um, and I am a huge believer of that. I had a long conversation with Charles a few days ago, and we were talking about the something that I believe, and he has slightly different, I think they're not very different. He probably would expand on what his thoughts are. But the whole idea of technology as I say the word tool, Charles has a different word for it, but to think about technology as a tool for impact, um, to be able to leverage on understanding cultures, understanding humans, understanding the challenges people face, and then be able to build solutions on top of that is how I understand technology as a non-techie. Um, but what I hear you say, Celestine, is Building purpose-driven tech career starts with understanding your values. And perhaps in that conversation, I have built in my values. Uh, one of my core values is around impact. And then therefore then leveraging on the core value on impact to leverage on technology. But I just wanted to hear from you some thoughts around one or two things you'd advise somebody who is trying to marry purpose and tech uh, to think about. So those are perhaps the two questions. Uh, I will come back to you on Celeste. Uh, three now money how do i make my money uh, can i put it up in the chat room um, and then secondly around the india bangladesh what are practical things i can do to understand some innovations there and leverage on them here and then three from a purpose-driven career here one important key takeaway is understand your own values and then leverage on technology to be able to marry those two um, but what any other advice you may have for anybody who is in the tech or even any other field and is trying to understand how to marry purpose and other fields um, is the third question. Celestine, I hope I have made sense. I want to just to throw out the questions and then give you an opportunity and then we'll open up the chat room. And then Charles, I love the conversation you've had around the 11-year-old. Um, the 
we were having a debate about whether technology is overrated in today's world. Um, and I like the way you simplified it around coding literacy enables me as a programs person to build apps for my programs. Or coding enables me who is in good coding literacy enables me who is in banking to think about how do I build an app for my teller business. I loved that analogy. And so when you put it that way, I can understand the gap of 230 million. Um, but I, I guess for me though, and this is a concern that I tend to have often, there is a sense in which Technology can become a hype, and it should be by student. Um, and especially from a young person's perspective, there's, uh, there's a conversation we were having around in the 1990s, as an example, people discovered the typewriter. And when depending with your understanding of typewriting, everybody went and became a typewriter and did a degree in typewriting. But whether we all needed a degree in typewriting is a question that we can sit with today with hindsight and say, actually, maybe, maybe not. And so just some thoughts around to what extent should young people be thinking about digital literacy and what tools exist for that is the second question that I have for you, Charles. <laughs> Um, and then just to recap all the other things and, and I'm done with my questions, I love the way you brought together the power of chaos in the world, COVID, uh, post-election violence, and how humanity seems to seems to go up every time. I mean, if I think about where we started with the Renaissance, a big part of the Renaissance was after the Black Death, and then the post-election violence, and we all screamed, but we move higher. COVID allowed us to embrace technology a bit more. And for me as a person, one of the bigger things that I pick from that is to always look for what's not seen in these tragedies. Um, because I think many of us get caught up in the tragedies that are COVID, the tragedies that are post-election violence, but each of those tragedies seem to have taken humanity to the next level in one form or another. And so building that character of um, leveraging on these tragedies as possible opportunities is something I'm hearing for myself. Um, I like the way you brought together the conversation of we've done the work of infrastructure, policy, and skills. And in effect, I think what you're saying is we've set the foundation for us to be able to do bigger things. Um, one of the conversations I had in India that I loved is they're asking, how do we use the existing MPESA technology, the equivalent, to build solutions on it? Um, and I think we do that here, but I think the bigger philosophy being leveraging on existing infrastructure to innovate, because sometimes it's easy to go and now start ground zero. But I think what you're saying is we have the infrastructure, you have the policy, we have the skills. Now ask, how can we use those to innovate? I am recapping some of the things you guys said. Um, and I like the way, uh, uh, Celestine, you talked about the power of technology, and I think uh, Charles also spoke to this, the power of technology to bring dignity to people, um, the solutions it brings in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of just general social social protections is what technology brings um, on the table. And lastly, I like, I like the last slide where you talked about the advocacy and which for me speaks to responsibility. And I think it answers to a question that Karafa had asked. I do not think there's innovation that doesn't have a responsibility anchored on it that's relevant to today's world. Um, and it's easy for humans to think about how do we build innovations, but innovations are for humans and therefore responsibility is the foundation for any innovation. Um, so I like the way that you've connected that with advocacy. Um, because then we have a generation that's advocacy driven in TikTok, they will have one advocacy after another. And that's a good thing because it means then they can also look after our technological innovation. So I love that. Um, but then also them thinking through low cost technologies that reduce the digital divide um, and sort of the mainstreaming of technology. This has had a lot of things is in, is in effect what I am saying. Um, and I've just perhaps recapped some and uh, we will put this up and people can listen to it again. Uh, but perhaps Celestine to you, some of the questions that I've asked your thoughts on them and then we will look through the questions and pick up some that are urgent and then uh, we will see how we close them. 
Um, so I'll start to, um, I'll, I'll just talk very fast in the interest of time. And yes. I'll start probably the first question that you asked about how do I make money in this digital age as a 25 year old? Um, what I always tell and, and, and what we were never told in our era is look at what you've learned, studied, please, because that's a skill that you know. Uh, mm -hmm. go, go to a space where whatever career that you have learned and then look at how you can leverage technology to kind of like um, uh, work in, in line with that career. Let's say it's a English and, and poetry. Uh, there are people who write jokes um, for, uh, um, is it the National Geographic or one of these online magazines where you earn from 50 to $60 an hour for a joke. And it just depends on research. Go on YouTube, do your research, uh, online work, online platforms, um, start learning on the basics of how to do that, but don't stick to uh, to to platforms that you earn about 20 cents or te you get very bogged up in the mind. Mm. Those are for people who are, um, uh, the dad just finished from four or people in high school or people who very, very basic, who don't have a diploma. So don't stick to those roles because you'll get very tired. Push yourself and, 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 and uh, expand your mindset in terms of what are the opportunities out there, and it can even be as easy as googling what are people, what are youth in other countries doing, and that comes especially also to the same Bangladesh and India, in order to make money when they've just finished school, and that opens your mindset to the possibilities of how people manage their skills and their talent. To it, stick to one path. Don't waver. Don't think, oh, this person is a web developer. They are making so much money. Let me do it. It It may do what you're good at and what you do effortlessly so that you, when you're learning or upskilling yourself, you're upskilling yourself just from the tech research on, on, on platforms or opportunities that merge tech with the kind of skill set that you've got. Um, more, many times we are kind of like wavered in terms of like, I have taught a lot of people who, have made very good money probably in things like SEO, which is something that I learned very well. It's never been me and I've never enjoyed it. But there are people actually who enjoy SEO like perfectly. It was never for me. And when I'm looking at sometimes my students are making a million in a month, I'm like, it's their patience. It's not me. I'm more, in, I'm more interested in giving this knowledge and impact and information. That mm -hmm. way I feel fulfilled more than even making that million and just sitting in front of a desk. So people have different callings and different passions. And, and as you're doing that, uh, looking for the money, as you're saying, yes, 25, also try it because at the end of the day, it is very rewarding for you to expand your circle or your, your social circle or your, um, it's not economic because because uh, it, it it's your your people whom you know who understand what you do and who who can vouch for you. Um, it's it's social capital. It's very good to expand your social capital more than the capital like the the being very uh, 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 capital minded only. You're making the money, the money, the money. Do grow social capital as well as growing your own physical capital if you can you'll find that it's much more fulfilling in the later years than if you just decided to grow the capital itself you, money comes and it goes but reputation it's what even will it benefit your children or uh, your relatives or your siblings or people who you know when you're in when you're in a fix and it's how you interacted with them and how they remember how you interacted with you that enabled them to help you to the next step. Um, that's for making money. And the other thing, how do we leverage purpose and work in the digital space? I think I've even answered the two questions in that one question. For me, my satisfaction comes into 
um, uh, doing good, in sharing information, sharing knowledge, and then getting feedback. I've done similar projects. When you're looking at India and, and um, there's a skill that you've got, Look at how young people are even applying it in their communities. And one thing that I keep on telling people, is not a matter even of building a platform. Um, doing a pilot or doing a proof of concept can even just you and your friends and you and your family. And if you take five, five people from within your circle, or you say, let me do a pilot of 50 people, you'll get so much data and information that you wouldn't have expected had you designed a platform. So what I would suggest is, document everything that you're doing and be very de deliberate. Know that this is what I'm doing and this is the end goal and document all the narrative in between. The statistics, the data, the stories, um, the, the emotions, the empathy, that enables you to be able to work with the people and make sure that they also understand and also practice the data privacy policies. Make sure that people understand if you're recording them or you're taking images or you're taking their quotations, make sure they sign an NDA form. So you start everything from the right start, uh, from the right way. Put your all your 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 your, your metrics and, and deliverables and all the the, the 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 is it things that can legally bind you. Put them all in place while interacting with the groups that you're interacting with while documenting. And that would enable you, when you decide to have even a proof of concept and you're seeking maybe seed funding for something, developing whatever you want to develop, you have enough data and statistics. And even it shows passion on, on the direction that you've gone. And that also validates that uh, uh, um, uh, the, the research that you've done into that community or that society that you're working with. And then what was the last one? I can't remember the last question. I think you've answered all of them. I've answered all of them, yeah? Yes, yes. Um, So uh, for me, I think um, uh, uh, that is, is how you should always look at what you're doing. And don't jump from career to career. Try and understand how what the next person is doing. Like I always li like to learn because I'm an educator at the end of the day. And I'll use that as an example, but I wouldn't want to do it because it's just not me. But I'll know... If I need someone in that or someone needs someone in that, I've already got someone I can plug them into because I understood very well what they were doing. I love so that. I can say for now. Thank you. No, I love that. Thank you, Celestine. Charles, I don't know if you're still with us. Um, and if you have some thoughts you wanted to add in the questions, if you've been able to reflect on them. Yeah, uh, Esther, thanks. So two points. One is on what it means to develop digital skills. Uh, I think the starting point is uh, very well put by Steve Jobs some time back, many years back when he was asked, so what is this digital? And he said, uh, technology is a bicycle for the mind. What that then means in short is that regardless of what careers people are going to choose, hmm. Uh, the chance is that for most of those careers, uh, technology is going to help them get to do whatever other career they're doing in a way that's more effective, more efficient, mm -hmm. chances are lower cost and things like this. Number one. Number two, um, a, a, a big part of this difference will be made in the context when you then compare several years later between um, a uh, bakery that used tech and a bakery that did not, you know, even if it's as basic as social media and uh, counting tools and, you know, just basic automation. If you came back to these two businesses, all factors considered and held equal, if you compare this to several years later, you'll see a big difference in terms of the, the quality of uh, customer experience, what kinds of employees they're able to attract, and what kinds of uh, cost and operating structure they're able to adapt just by automation of very, very simple processes. Uh, for that reason then, when we talk about 230 million opportunities, this is a whole pyramid of opportunities. So uh, there will be people that use tech on a day-to-day -day only for transaction processing. There's going to be some who use it for an intermediate reason. 
building their own self-service tools, for example, on data analysis, for example, on uh, personal use uh, apps to just make their lives easier. And then there's going to be a small proportion, probably three to 5% who then have high-end engineering skills who will then go to, uh, or rather will have a mathematical background, a statistical background, uh, an engineering background or a computer science background uh, with depth, uh, you know, to then be professionals at creating platforms that are more advanced and things like this. Uh, to your second question on whether tech is just a tool, again, um, the, the how I choose to see it is that uh, if we compare tech, and this is usually my uh, my easiest analogy to uh, for me myself to understand or to explain something, is a comparison between building in tech, um, you know, building in the virtual world, and building. Uh, structures in the real world. So, for example, building a house, building Okay, I think I saw Celestine move, so it must be Charles who is a bit stuck. Um, I think I want to start to bring this to a wrap, um, and I want to open it up to two people to share what they're hearing, what questions they have. Um, then we will take the last questions. Um, I'm seeing a question here. I'm curious how both Celestine and Charles were able to balance the need to create positive change and the necessity to make money and giving the next generation a good life. So um, that's in their careers. That could be a question that perhaps you could conclude with, uh, Celestine, just how you did the balance. I. I think the battle at, and this is expected, the battle at, at mid twenties, early thirties is often, it's it's one of those that shifts in thirties, tends to shift in thirties, um, but in mid twenties, um, late twenties, and actually even early thirties, you're battling with how do I make sure, it, it's still going back to that same question of making money. And so the question here mm -hmm. is, how did you balance um, the pos creating positive social change and the necessity for making money and giving the next generation a good life? But I think you answered that a bit, I think, uh, but it could be part of your last comments. Um, and then I can see a question from Nicholas. Is it a master at tech company of an equal, environment, equal environmental impact as it is innovating within it? I'm not sure I understand that well. Can we say that tech for good is synonymous with social entrepreneurship that's using a uh, technology? Paul, I agree with that uh, synonymity, but I'll, I'll invite also Charles and uh, Celestine to speak to that question. All right, so I wanna hear maybe from one or two people, um, I'm sure we are way gone uh, past our time. So if there's anyone who wants to share what you're hearing, what it means for you, what questions it's left um, for you, be helpful. And then perhaps uh, Celestine, you can close after that. I don't know if there's anyone who has some thoughts they'd like to share what you're hearing. I think one of the things that I had Charles saying is thinking of technology as a bi square, I like that analogy. So if I'm in technology, or if I'm in real estate, I'm in real estate, but this bicycle helps me to do work more efficiently and effectively. Um, and therefore then convert that conversation from just technology being part of our normal lives. I liked that analogy that he had. I don't know if there's anyone who has a question or a comment they'd like to share. Karafa, perhaps you could share one or two takeouts and then maybe one person and then we will do our final thoughts. Um, I don't know whether I'm to jump in here because I've been missing. Um, Sorry, no, I wanted them, I, I wanted my to hear connection something. is not so good. No problem. I, I wanted them, they give us last questions or comments and then you do your okay. last, last, we close with you. Um, so just two people to speak up and then we come to you for the last comments. Ruth, your hand is up, it's up. Um, wanted to say something? Uh, yes, thank you for the session. It's really been informative. I think for me, my take home is um, from the analogy of the 11-year-old. Okay, besides the personal take home, the ones that I need to apply on is um, one where um, I can pass on because I've, I've, what I've gotten is 
the need to pass on values to their children around us so that even as they get to that age, they will have values so that values already ingrained in them. Uh, so that even as they advance in the AI and all that, they have, you know, they have a, a good foundation. I think, um, you know, with my nieces, people around me, children around me. Yeah, I think that one was a good one. Thank you. I love that. That's a fantastic thought. Um, just preparing them for the times ahead by helping them to sit with values and also with just conversations around who they are and what matters to them. Nicholas, you wanted to add something? Yes. Um, well, it has been a very, very informative session from my end. And uh, well, one of the things that I, ha I have come out with uh, from uh, self Nicholas, sorry, we can hear you well. Oh, sorry, sorry, I apologize. Um, is it a must that each tech company offer? Uh, equal environmental impact as uh, they are innovating within within them like the level of innovation should be equal to the environmental impact that they are making um recently uh we participated in one and that's why i'm so so curious to know in knowing much about it yeah and i'd also like to appreciate uh, mr charles simba the last time i was with, with him he really um challenged me a lot Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, I my thoughts on whether the environmental impact should be equal to the innovation. I I would say go concurrently. Think about social impact. Think about environmental impact. Um, and think about innovation. All three together will be helpful. Um, I don't I don't know how that looks like in terms of whether it's equal, it's not equal, but at least make sure that as you're thinking about your innovations, you're thinking about what's the environmental impact, what's the social impact, and also primarily because in today's world, that's the way people are moving towards. So the e it's the ESG at work, the environment, the social governance is becoming a big deal. So as you think about innovations, you must make sure that those but at least ideally you should make sure that those three things are part of your thought process. It makes your innovation more palatable in today's um, world. Um, I want to end there, Karafa. Maybe you could close with your takeaways and then perhaps uh, close the session. Charles, I don't know if there's anything you want to add um, and Celestine, and then we hand over to, Char to Karafa to close. Thank you everybody for staying till the end. We appreciate it. Charles, anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, no, nothing further. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your time and uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Charles. Uh, we will definitely be welcoming you back. This was just a welcome back. Um, we probably had given you a very long break, um, but thank you for all your support for over the years. We appreciate it. And Karibu back. Um, is the This is your welcome session. Um, Celestine, anything else you'd like to add? I don't know if Celestine is still with us. Karafa, um, perhaps your thoughts, and then you can close it. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. And I wish us all a very good night. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you, Celestine in absentia. This has indeed been a very informative session, and I hope that it has given us quite a bit to think about as to how we can leverage technology to do good. And for those who are still wondering, what can I do if I'm not an 11-year-old? I believe uh, Charles has also let us know that we, we have a role to play in making sure that the realities that we want to see within the technological spaces are actually brought to light. The question then is how do we look at technology within the various spaces that we are serving? I think today's conversation has enabled us to debunk the notion that we need to be techies to be able to leverage technology uh, for good. And I hope that even beyond this conversation, we can always come back uh, to the table and ask how is our government assisting us in leveraging on the technology that exists? How can I make the most use of the resources that we have online? Because we should be lifelong learners to be able to continuously innovate 
in all the areas that we will be in. And to all of you for being here up until this hour, I want to say thank you. You have demonstrated capacity to learn. And I believe in this digital age, it is those who are willing to learn and relearn and relearn who are going to sit at the top of the pyramid that Charles showed us in his uh, segment. And for that, I want to celebrate you once again, and I invite you just to use your digital hands to clap for yourselves for being here at this very end, and to ask, have you followed us on LinkedIn at Lapid Leaders Africa? Stay tuned for the next segment of the Renaissance uh, Masterclass series. Thank you, Celestine. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Esther, for making this possible. And to all of us here in the audience, should you be interested in pursuing the Lapid Crossroads program, I invite you to submit your application. We will be sharing the link, uh, the registration form once again in the chat box. Uh, should you require any further clarification as to whether this program is for you, you can always reach out to us and we will be able to sort you out. And I would like to invite a volunteer. I don't know whether Esther, you would like to volunteer on this to close today's session with a quick word of prayer, as we call it an evening. No, anyone else can keep for us with the word of prayer. Thank you. And I think I've seen Celestine has just joined, but he's not, she's not perhaps able to speak. But thank you very much, Celestine. Thank you very much. Charles, I volunteer to pray for us. Um, and then we close. Right. As the spirit guide, who would like to close the word of prayer? Thank you, Samson. Okay, let's pray. Yes, sir. Okay, let's believe and pray. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks, praise, glory, and honor for this session that you have just had. We thank you for the information that you have, for the learning period that you have gotten. We thank you for all the knowledge that we have learned today. King of kings, Lord of lords, we ask you that may you continue impacting uh, Lapid, may you continue impacting our uh, facilitators and our mentors with more information to share with us, to teach us, to even impact the next generation of leaders, Lord God. And Lord, as we go, uh, for this night to sleep and uh, to sleep and rest, we ask you that may you be with us and may you continue protecting us and guiding each and every step of uh, each and every one of us through Christ our Lord and Savior. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Um, good night. We will share with you guys some form. Karafa will uh, please give us feedback so that we know how to keep this going. Good night. Good night. Thank you.